That was a beautiful way to start Lent. Thank you, Ryan, Helen, and the choir. You may have noticed these beautiful paraments, the silk painting on the banner here and the two paraments on the pulpit and lectern. These were done by our own Valerie Horn and are new to us today. And we're so grateful for Val's abilities. She just does everything, uh, bookkeeping, marketing, painting. <laughs> Very talented. Thank you, Val. Once on a day that has been long forgotten, in a quiet room, among poverty and despair, a 16-year-old girl gave birth to a newborn boy. She did not name him. Perhaps she meant to give him a name, but didn't get around to it. There was no father to ask. Truth be told, she wasn't really certain who the father was. The nurse asked when filling out the paperwork what to put in the line for the child's name, and the mother replied, he ain't got no name. Well, we have to put something on the birth certificate, said the nurse. Look, I'm tired, sighed the mother, and I'm going back to sleep. So the nurse reluctantly wrote in the box, no name. It went on the birth certificate along with the mother's last name, Maddox. Along with this name was the child's inky little footprint. And that's how the baby's life began. No name Maddox. And when his mother remarried, he became no name Manson. When he turned nine or ten, he realized that his mother really was a prostitute. And as a child, he laid in bed and he heard the telltale signs of her evening activities. No one really had to tell him the truth. He just figured it out. And sometimes his mother sounded happy, other times it seemed to him she sounded a bit fearful. Her son, listening at night, was not always certain which was which. And as an adult, he still sort of gets fear and happiness mixed up in his head. As soon as he was old enough, he disappeared into the streets, and no name was unknown for a long time. Eventually, he resurfaced on the West Coast and had a name that he had given himself, Charles, Charles Manson. He ran all over California, and he was trying to kill someone like his mother. As a minister, I want to ask people like Charles Manson's mom, weren't you made for more than this. So many times I want to ask a person that question. Weren't you made for more than this? That's because I genuinely believe that each of us is imprinted with God's holy spark of divinity. Each of us. Not just in this room, but outside. We are made in the image of God. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. So today we're starting on a new journey, the journey of Lent. And as Paul uh, was going to talk about in the children's message, but then told a different story, I want to talk about Lent. So Lent is a 40-day journey that leads us into Easter. These 40 days plus Sundays represent the time that Jesus spent in the wilderness before he started his public ministry. Lent starts with Ash Wednesday, which was last Wednesday, and it ends on Holy Saturday, which is the day before Easter. Lent is a time of preparation, of penitence, and fasting. Often people give up something for Lent, Anybody give anything up for Lent? A couple of people. 
Um, often people give up meat or sweets. I have often encouraged people to add something for Lent. Anybody add anything for Lent? Okay, several people. Uh, you can add meditation, prayer, exercise, reading, a variety of things. Lent started being practiced early after Jesus' death and resurrection, but it was formalized in 325 CE. The day before Lent, uh, the day before it starts, is known as Fat Tuesday. It often has pancakes associated with it. It's also Mardi Gras, and the pancakes race was held in liberal and then in England. Any of you have pancakes or fat on Tuesday to celebrate Mardi Gras, the last day before Lent? Aha, okay. So at UCC, our theme for Lent is focused on the seven deadly sins, but more importantly, the seven life-affirming virtues that correspond with those seven deadly sins. And today, hopefully, when you came in, and if not, as you go out, you will receive this charm. On the charm is the scale of justice. Someone asked if we were celebrating the many lawyers we have in our church. <laughs> no. The scale of justice is to remind you that we all strive for balance in our lives. Please use this scale of justice through the Lenten season to remind yourself of the balance required in your spiritual life. Now, this is not balance between sin and liberty and um, the scales of justice, but rather the um, need for us to balance our lives. We are all sinners, of course, and we have the opportunity for life-affirming virtues, and those virtues enhance our soul life. We'll be using Robin Myers' book, The Virtue and the Vice, as a guide for these sermons, but also I taught Christian ethics at Newman University for about 16 semesters, so I'm going to be using those experiences from my classes as well. Let me tell you a little bit about how the seven deadly sin list came about uh, long ago. Before most humans could read or write, church leaders produced a list of sins so that people would know what not to do. This list is not in the Bible per se, but it was a list of the medieval church, and it was said that these were about the most, the worst things that you could do that would separate you permanently from God. So the top seven that they came up with were, are you ready, drum roll, pride, envy, anger, lust, gluttony, greed, and sloth. Along with those deadly sins, okay, those weigh on one side of your scale of justice, right? On the other side of your scale of justice, the church listed the answers to those seven deadly sins, the seven virtues. Humility, kindness, patience, chastity, abstinence, liberality, and diligence. So you might ask, why seven of each? Well, you have to remember seven is a holy number. There are seven days of the week, seven days of creation, and so on. Now, I don't know about you, but I would argue that there would be more grievous sins on my list. I'm really creative about sinning. There, there are seven I mean, I can think of more grievous sins than the seven they listed. Uh, Nietzsche, for example, argued that cruelty, savagery, indifference to human suffering, tyranny, ethnic hatred, religious persecution, and racial bigotry should be on the list instead of the seven that were listed. 
They're all more deadly, he said, than the ones that the early church fathers listed. I'd like to suggest that any list of ethical dilemmas set by a human or group of humans consistently has a, a political element to it. You know, any list that people put together is going to be affected by what's going on in the world at that time and by what part of the world they're listing it in. In other words, the social situation of the community is reflected in the ethical concerns brought to the forefront of any discussion. So today's sermon is going to focus on the sin of pride and the virtue of humility, or saying it in a positive way, worthiness. Now, when the early church leaders put together this list of sins, pride always came first on their list. Pride elicits idolatry and even the worship of the self. The English synonyms for pro, pro, the pro, proudness um, include arrogance, haughtiness, conceit, egocentric, narcissist, insolent, presumptuous, and vain. Anybody want to admit to this sin? Don't raise your hand. The Greeks called it hubris, thinking yourself superior to the gods. So to be proud in a classic sense is to be out of your place in the order of things, not to know one's proper relationship to God. And our traditional text for today speaks of this sin. And think of it not in terms of being proud of your child or proud in, in that sense of the word, but proud in the terms of not knowing your relationship to God. And this is from Proverbs 16. The highway of the upright avoids evil. Those who guard their way preserve their lives. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be of a lowly spirit among the poor than to divide the spoil with the proud. So if you go back to the story of Charles Manson, the problem his mother had was not pride, but a lack of pride. She had a feeling of worthlessness. She had forgotten that she was precious in God's eyes, that she was God's own masterpiece, that she was made for more than what she was choosing in her life. Last year, when I was on sabbatical, I traveled to Savannah, Georgia. And whenever my friends and I went out to eat in what they call the low country, they brought a dish of fresh, hot, hush puppies to the table when you sat down. Anybody been to the low country and had hush puppies? Ugh. Can you smell them? Now, these are not like the hush puppies you get in Kansas. Honey, they're not at all like what we get. These were warm, fresh out of the kitchen, delicious little bits of heaven that broke open in your mouth, full of cornbread, spices, butter, lard, homemade goodness, these little fritters melt in your mouth. And just when you got to the end of the bowl, they brought you some more. You do not order them, and you can't do anything to stop them. They just come to your table. They are free. They come when you sit down, whether you're just there for a drink or a meal. They're free. <laughs> They're warm right out of the oven, and they melt in your mouth, and they're free. <laughs> That's how it is with worthiness, too. 
You can't do anything to earn it. It just comes. Take a minute to look at the front of your bulletin. On it is a picture of a father with his two-month-old child. The unconditional love that is passed between them is what I'm talking about. This child is going to know that she is worthy, not because of anything she has done, but because she is loved just by being. Self-esteem has to do with talent and merit. We compare our abilities with the abilities of others and how we measure up to the standards of our society. Self-respect, on the other hand, has to do with the inherent value and dignity of all persons and is by nature non-comparative. The answer to sin or arrogance or wrongful pride is knowing one's self-worth, knowing that we are God's own beloved, that God looks at us with that look, with that look of the baby looking at the father and the father looking at the baby through no, no deserving, but just pure love. Tuesday night, I was at Fiddler on the Roof at Century Two. Many of you know the story of Fiddler on the Roof. The Jews are kicked out of their beloved hometown of Anatevia, and they are dispersed to many different places around the world where they will have to make new lives without their beloved friends and family, the daughters of Tepia go all over. And the story ends with poignant sadness as the friends and family leave one another. I looked to my left and to my right, and the people around me had tears going down their faces, even though I'm sure m most of them had seen the musical multiple times. It's representative of the Hebrew story over the millennial. Knowing that I was preaching on worthiness, not pride, I thought about how they played into this story of the chosen people in the Hebrew Bible. Ironically, outside of Century Two, after the play, one of the friends I attended the play with noticed a homeless person sleeping on the ground in a sleeping bag. And as the theater people passed by, the homeless person seemed oblivious. He or she did not move or beg for money. Apparently, the person was asleep in the sleeping bag and slept through the crowd passing by. My thoughts turned again. Did this precious soul know his or her worth in the eyes of God? And did the crowd notice? Did we recognize that the tears we shed for the people of Anatevka in the theater who were pushed out of their hometown because of their race and religion were actually collect, connected to the plight of the person, the very real person, in the sleeping bag? that all of God's children have inherent worth, not because of who they are, but because of who loves them. That all of them, the actors on the stage and the people that they played and the person in the sleeping bag, all of them were made for more than this. When faced with the sin of puffed up pride. The answer is often to learn our inherent worth as a beloved child of God. Amen.